yesterday in Brussels, the foreign ministers of the European member states gathered in a foreign affairs council of the Council of Europe with, to say the least, a full agenda. Uh, there are two main items that they dealt with, according to the High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy, Federica Mogherini, were cooperation uh, with and about Middle Eastern uh, turbulence and terror, and responding to an assertive uh, uh, Russian state which desires apparently to assert hegemony in, in the region. Even if those were the only two items on the foreign policy agenda of the European Union, that would be a lot. But in fact, of course, the agenda is chock full of items uh, that uh, the new high representative, Ms. Mogherini, uh, the president of the council, Donald Tusk, and the European Commission president, Albert Juncker, have to, have to respond to. Um, as an example, China, which is indicated in the Carnegie report, which forms the basis of our conversation, is now the EU's second largest trading partner. And the EU is China's largest trading partner. But economic issues do not form the center of what the Carnegie report calls the greatest global challenge. That is perhaps China's own nationalist assert assertion its territorial assertions, and what that will mean for Asia. Viewed the other way, the central relationship between the United States and the EU would seem to be at the most propitious moment in recent history for coordinated actions. After all, differences over um, uh, policies on terror, how to deal with Iraq, um, how to deal with Russia, have for the most part receded. Um, the U.S. and the European uh, and the European Union form, of course, the core of the global economy. This would be a moment when there are both challenges and what appears to be a coordinated capacity to respond. And yet, I have the troubling feeling that the future of that relationship will be determined by whether or not we wash our chickens in chlorine. And I'm going to ask our uh, panelists to comment, maybe not on chickens, but on the trade pact that is currently in negotiations. <laughs> but the EU, of course, has a broader neighborhood. Its immediate neighborhood includes several Balkan states, which are still waiting for membership. And we do not necessarily have to ascribe to the sentiment, which I love to quote, that says, all wars begin in the Balkans regardless of probable cause to recognize that this is a turbulent region and the EU has a heavy responsibility there. More broadly, of course, there are states eager for membership outside of uh, the Balkans in the so-called neighborhood, which include Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia, which are also clamoring for a better relationship, and North Africa, where people are, to say the least, voting with their feet. Now, some would say this really belongs under the term of enlargement, especially the Balkans. But given that it's likely to be a decade or more before these states joined, I think we can properly include it as part of external, external relations, especially since it involves some competition with both Russia and Turkey. Um, the list, of course, goes on. And, they, and one could uh, illustrate many other items. But one of the things I liked about the Carnegie report, and by the way, the report I'm referring to can be um, accessed from our website for the site of this conversation. You'll see a link to that Carnegie report, um, which comes up even before we post this conversation. To me, the most interesting part of that report is that it raised some fundamental questions, which I am going to raise with our, with our panel today, which is something like the following. Does the world still need something like an EU? After all, in past history, one could claim that, well, the end of World War II or the onset of the Cold War or even the post-Cold War period required a, uni a uni European institutional unity. Maybe it's not necessary anymore. Or maybe if it is, 
the eu has lost what one recent observer called its mojo. it's a political science term, so i don't want to use, i don't want to throw around jargon. but secondly, can the eu play such a role with it with virtually no military capacity? the carnegie report said quote sometimes europe may have to go to war alone as my daughter might say really does it have the capacity to do that and if it doesn't then can it be a global actor third is the eu responsible for the post cold war order is that what it role supposed to be protecting that order rather than perhaps accommodating to challengers who resent being excluded name your brick for example fourth if the eu cannot itself challenge its major ideological challenger which today is not communism after all but a kind of alternative vision of how society should be organized um, cited mostly in a militant islam if the eu cannot challenge that then indeed it will have lost not just its mojo but its reason for being the eu is of course a unique foreign policy actor in fact it's really 28 foreign policy actors because in in no area of uh, competence do the states defend themselves with greater vigor than in foreign policy so it's reasonable to ask whether the EU can act at all effectively in such a situation and related to that whether its institutions newly invigorated uh, after Lisbon uh, are up to the task well this is a scary agenda it certainly scared me as I put this together um, but fortunately we have excellent people who both raise these questions and I hope will offer some answers uh, today so let me introduce them I would like to begin with uh, two of the co-authors of the Carnegie paper uh, Stefan Lenné who is here who is a visiting scholar at the Carnegie U Europe but in, his, in real life you might say um, he has served as director general for political affairs of the Austrian Ministry for Foreign Affairs and prior to that the General Secretary of the Council of the European Union as Director for Balkans, East Europe, and Central Asia. He's widely published on these topics, and we're happy to have him. Uh, another co-author was Ulrich, is Ulrich Speck, who is visiting, a visiting scholar um, at Carnegie Europe. For a long time, he was a fellow at the Madrid-based think tank Friday, who used to publish a weekly news sort of uh, digest, which I profited by. And he and I share the fact that we both work for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, though I did it a long time ago uh, when communism was the big challenge. Um, joining us from Washington is Sir Michael Lay, who is currently a Transatlantic Fellow at the, uh, and Senior Advisor to the German Marshall Fund. He is well qualified to talk on these topics because he spent 30 years working in the EU uh, I first met him when he was Director General for Enlargement of the European Commission, but he also spent time working on external relations with the responsibility for European neighborhood policy. And he has published and given interviews recently on that exact question. Joining us from Rome is Dr. Natalie Tocci, who is Deputy Director of the Instituto Affare Internazionale with special responsibility for the EU and its neighborhood. She's the editor of International Spectator. She has published a great deal on uh, EU relations, probably most notably in the volume Ronald H. Lyndon, Turkey and its Neighbors, put in a little plug there. And she is currently a, a, a foreign policy advisor uh, to M Madam uh, Federica Mogherini. So I think we have the right person there. Finally, it is common in our discussions to have a pit person at the table with me, uh, someone we can dragoon into uh, uh, sitting beside me, but this time we're cheating. Instead of having a pit person beside me, we have a pit PhD in Costas Corticacus, 
who is at the university of illinois affiliated both with their center and their department of political science and he is also someone who pays attention to eu affairs including foreign policy with a panel like that uh we can hardly go wrong so i'd like to um i'd like to ask the panel to first consider the broadest question that is given the recent history is there still a role to be played for an organization like the eu or has its time passed and it best simply gracefully exit from the stage who wants to who wants to take that on yes stefan and by the way each of them have given me permission to address them by their first names i'm not being rude that thank you later. thank you very much for including me uh, i think the eu as an international actor is needed more than ever uh, basically uh, i found this book by this carnegie colleague Moshe Nimes really convincing about the decline of power uh, where power is easier to gain, but much more difficult to keep and to exercise. And this has positive side effects, but also very negative ones. And one of the negative ones is on, on global issues uh, like uh, uh, climate change, like mass migration, like uh, uh, pandemics, etc. Uh, simply, and we, the way we put it is that uh, interdependence is massively outracing international governance. And I think the EU is uh, one of the few actors that can play a, a positive role in ensuring global governance. Uh, it has uh, its overall role in the world, of course, is declining. There's no question about it. In, the, in a way, this is going back to normal. In the year 1800, China had the biggest GDP, followed by India. And I think this 200 years of, of European ascendance is sort of naturally coming to an end. But I think still, if you look at the, the assets that the EU has as the biggest economy altogether, the biggest trading power, the biggest source of international development assistance, the biggest source of humanitarian aid, uh, these are vast assets, they're huge assets. And if you look at many of the bricks that are certainly rising, they're rising much more slower uh, and and there are, many of them are in rather poor shape. So I think I would say that the EU is one of the big, uh, one of the few international actors that can uh, play a very constructive role in sort of rebuilding and strengthening global governance. That's one of the key challenges. Yes, Michael. You have to be unmuted. Um, Don't leave, Michael. <laughs> Where did you go? I'm, I'm asking for some help. He, he's, um, okay. Alistair, Speak up. Can you unmute? We can hear you and we can see you. Oh, it's working okay? It's working. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, the world does still need the European Union, um, but I think we need to be clear about what the European Union can do well and what it can do less well and perhaps should not be expected to do at all. I think, first of all, we must remember what the European Union is within itself. It is no mean feat to have uh, an area comprising much of the European continent, which is a zone of peace where there are no obstacles to uh, free circulation. Um, the European Union internally is a very strong force against extreme nationalism. Um, it, it, the problem is that internally, we very much have the ideology that unless there is a major new challenge on the horizon that we're in the process of meeting, there is somehow a setback. But we shouldn't forget all that has been accomplished until now internally. Externally, however, I think we need to distinguish much more clearly what we can do and what we can't do. What we can do are all the things that, uh, that Stefan said and more. The European Union is strong as a trade actor. You mentioned the negotiations with the United States at the outcome, the provision of development assistance, technical assistance, training, um, climate change Stefan mentioned. Uh, you could add in 
a whole range of such subjects where the EU is an important actor. Where it has gone astray is that at the beginning of this century, as a kind of shortcut towards some kind of political federation in Europe, the member states decided that the traditional field of foreign policy, which is very closely linked with sovereignty, should become one of the focuses of the EU's activity. But in reality, they are not ready to see the European Union become a major actor on issues of war and peace, uh, of life and death, everything that used to be called high policy. And yet, we have created a new bureaucracy, a new role, a new foreign policy chief, charged with an area of policy that the member states wish essentially to keep to themselves. And I think we could be m most effective if we concentrate on the areas where we have real competence and skills and acknowledge that in other areas, as for example, how to cope with Russia, or you mentioned at the outset policy towards uh, the Middle East, for example, whether we like it or not, the member states are going to want to make most of the running on those issues themselves. Natalie, let me turn to you because the, our, two, our first two speakers have outlined very different points of view, if I may. Uh, and drawing on the Carnegie report, uh, there seems to be a much more activist suggestion on their part. Some, the, in fact, they wrote, quote, sometimes the Europeans will have to go to war alone, suggesting challenging Russia, challenging China. But Michael has just suggested, in a sense, focusing on, own, on those things that, are, that the EU can do and perhaps letting those other tasks um, go by. Do you think that, which of those do you think is more attractive or is that a false dichotomy? Have you heard me? What? Unmute. Can you hear me? Can you? Yes, now we can hear you. Did you hear my question? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, I actually think that, um, <laughs> in a sense, both both answers are are the correct ones. Whether we're looking at this from a uh, a global level of whether we then sort of uh, zoom in into, into the neighborhood. I mean, I think at the very broad global level, essentially we're uh, assisting a global shift of, of power. Now, that doesn't mean to say that power is shifting from A to B, uh, but it is shifting from A to, if you like, multiple and interdependent uh, centers of, of attraction and of repulsion. Uh, now, in the past, uh, generally, power shifts have been accompanied by a great deal of, uh, of, of war, of, of violence, of turmoil. Um, now, I think the challenge that we're all facing is to try and manage this shift uh, in, in a manner which is as, uh, uh, if you like, uh, peaceful as, as possible. Now, within this context, I think at the very broad global level, the EU does actually uh, and, and does contribute and can contribute uh, quite a lot. It is essentially, uh, in, in and of itself, it's uh, a, an entity which, through uh, institutionalization and integration, manages differences and manages potential conflict. Now, in an interdependent world, this in and of itself is a method, mm -hmm. uh, a mode of operation, so to speak, which even on hard security issues, and far away hard security issues, take, for instance, uh, the question of the South China Sea. There is an issue of, if you like, rule-bound action uh, and a method of rule-bound action that the European Union, because of what it is, uh, can actually be, actually contribute towards towards strengthening. So I think in a whole issue of uh, global, uh, you know, a whole you know sort of set of global challenges. Uh, ranging from hard security questions like the South China Sea uh, onto development issues, climate issues that Stefan and, and, and Michael were, uh, were also raising. Uh, because of what the EU is, there is a contribution uh, to what it can actually bring uh, to the global level. Now, moving on to the neighbourhood, here I think it's a different set of argumentations that uh, that set in. And it's simply one, uh, you know, the, the, the argument basically being that 
if it's not the EU, then who is it going to be? Uh, not necessarily that takes the lead, but that plays a prominent, uh, a prominent role. Now, uh, it's clear that uh, despite what is happening uh, in, in Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia, uh, the United States is probably not going to be, and it has not been, uh, the lead actor. Uh, and the European Union, if you like, by default, uh, both because of, if you like, supply and demand side factors is playing that dominant uh, role. But even to the south, not so much uh, in the Middle East and in the Gulf, but in North Africa, here again, it is by default the European Union, which is the major uh, external player. Now, of course, this is a world which is largely going to be dominated by domestic and by regional factors, but to the extent that external actors also play a role, uh, ranging from hard security uh, uh, questions such as Libya onto softer issues, if you like, of transition in countries like Morocco or Tunisia, uh, onto future issues, which at some point will inevitably explode like Algeria, it's clear that the European Union will by default be the major external player. Um, Rui, you stated in the, you as co-author stated in the Carnegie report, you put pride of place in terms of global challenges to China. And given the range of issues that Natalie just listed and the other speakers identified, why, and China is after all very far away, not a major military threat to the EU, why is that so significant in your view as to a, um, an issue that the EU must deal with on a foreign policy level? Thanks. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, just a, a few words uh, about the general um, um, importance of the EU as an actor. I think what we saw, we, we talk about the EU as if it were a coherent actor. Michael Lee said that their, the role of the member states has grown and there's some kind of disappointment with the post-Lisbon structures. I think the way the EU is working now is pretty much the way it is working in the Ukraine crisis. It provides a a supporting structure for member states or for coalitions of member states who want to achieve things. So the pol political will and, and the main driving force must come from the member states. Um, that, that would be my, my, my general remark. And of course, internally, the EU remains the main um, institution that is keeping Europe secure, free, and prosperous. It has replaced um, mistrust and fear with, with deep trust and uh, so on. But let, let me come to the China question. I think China, for many people, as you just said, why should the EU care? Why should Europe care? I mean, of course, there is the economic relation. The interdependence with China is growing, as it is in the US. And there's also an, a, a growing assumption that the EU must also you know, look at hotspots, um, not as something that the US can only deal with. The US role is diminishing, let's, let's say, in the, or has diminished in the last 20 years to a certain extent. And uh, the EU cannot just hide behind US power globally anymore. That is why some people try to push the EU to become more political in its relationship with Southeast Asia and look at the rise of China as something that is also a European concern, a major question of war and peace, um, economic um, interests, so on and so on. On the other side, what can the EU do? Rather little. Um, it can, I mean, basically it can choose to, to support the US role in the region. It won't be uh, uh, an actor in its own right, but it can support the US. It can try to send messages that support what the US is doing, or it can basically decide to stay neutral. I think these are the, the, the two big options. But I think from a Chinese perspective, it's very important um, to look at the EU as an actor. And um, it, um, 
this this applies basically not only to China but also to Russia. As long as the EU and the US are acting together in concert, they still represent, you know, they have a, um, a critical mass, a global critical mass that they can use if they are divided and try separate strategies. Um, the US will be much weaker and the EU will not be present at all. Kostas, I saw you had your hand up. <clears throat> Haven't got you yet. Unmute. <laughs> okay, sorry. We'll come. We will come back when you uh, when you find your vo <laughs> when you find your voice. Um, Michael, I want to come back to something Natalie said by focusing on the neighborhood and actually also on the tone of the overall report, given the significance of the neighborhood. And by that I mean, let's take the far East Europe neighborhood. Um, uh, not the North African one for right now. Is it time for the EU, and you yourself have, have spoken on the neighborhood policy, is it time for the EU to reconsider the question of whether membership should be offered to those states, at least as a possibility, in order to include leverage um, to induce domestic transformation or support those elements within these countries who want to further align with the West? Or is that simply not politically possible? Unmute. Got to unmute. Can you hear me now? There we go. Yes. Okay. All yeah. right. Good. Thank you. Um, there are two sides to this question. One is the readiness of the EU to contemplate further enlargement and the other is the preparedness of any of the countries concerned to assume the rights and obligations of membership. On the EU side, I think it's pretty evident that there is no appetite at all for the time being uh, to offer what in Brussels is referred to as a membership perspective to any countries beyond those who are presently in this category, i.e. the remaining non-members in what we call the Western Balkans and uh, Turkey, even though any European country that shares the EU values in principle under the treaty may apply for membership. But in practice, the member states feel that they're still digesting the last enlargement. A number of issues have arisen in that context, uh, whether backsliding on human rights in some cases, or the very emotive subject of migration in several member states. So the appetite simply isn't there. And then on the other side, let us consider the time it took for countries like Poland, the Czech Republic, uh, um, and uh, Estonia, and Latvia, from the overthrow of communism until they were ready to assume the obligations of membership. We're talking about a period that was basically a decade and a half. Now, the remaining countries in Eastern Europe um, which might in principle be eligible for membership, such as Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, um, perhaps Georgia, uh, not quite clear where the frontiers of Europe lie, whether Armenia certainly would consider itself to be a European country, Azerbaijan, you know, what's our criterion? Membership of the Council of Europe, geography, not quite clear. However, of the countries who might in principle be eligible in future for EU membership, they are still very far away. And one could consider that some of them have not even taken the first step equivalent to the overthrow of communism. Therefore, purely on their own merits, it would seem to me that these countries are probably at least 15 years away from conceivably being ready to assume the obligations of membership. So um, whether on the EU side or the preparedness of the countries, this question simply is not on the agenda for the time being. Of course, in Ukraine, the events 
that led to the um, departure from power of uh, Yanukovych um, and subsequent developments were seen as being very much in the, co in, in the context of a choice of the demonstrators, the activists uh, for Europe. And I understand mainly by this uh, a choice of the values uh, on which the European Union is based and a desire to improve material conditions in Ukraine, to fight against corruption and to make the place uh, more livable uh, and to stave off the risk of state failure in Ukraine. And Europe somehow stood for all those things. Um, but that does not imply that within the foreseeable future, Ukraine will be ready or the EU would be ready to take the next step. Uh, Stefan, go ahead. And then I'm going to come to you, Natalie. Stefan. Thanks. Uh, I think the Ukraine crisis is really a very special situation. It's the first time that the EU finds itself in a geopolitical competition. The first time it has an enemy. I think altogether the EU has uh, dealt relatively successfully uh, with this issue. I think we've shown greater coherence than people in Moscow or in Washington expected. Uh, coherence both in sort of confronting Russia, including through sanctions, but also coherence in terms of supporting Ukraine to have a fighting chance to really overcome this situation. I think we have a big deficit that um, Mr. Putin knows exactly what he wants to do with the region. He sees this as part of the uh, Russian sphere of influence. Whereas the EU is deeply divided on the future destiny of the regions. There are some countries who feel strongly that, that these countries should uh, have the same kind of promise from the EU as the Balkan countries have, and others who feel this is absolutely out of question. I do believe personally that uh, not immediately, but over the next two, three years, the EU needs to work actively to get its act together to be able to give an answer to the desire of these countries to, to join. I am totally with Michael that this is a question for the next decade, certainly not this one, maybe the one after the next decade. But uh, I think as long as we don't uh, get our act together in being able to answer this question that is being raised by these countries, and I think the Ukraine will probably submit an application for membership, we will be in a relatively weak uh, situation. Natalie. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the crisis in Ukraine has almost paradoxically um, raised the question of membership in a manner, in a, in a far more vivid manner than what we what we had before, and at the same time has made that prospect more more distant. Um, I think it's raised the question of membership, particularly for the three, if you like, so-called front runners, Georgia, uh, Ukraine and Moldova, because in a way it accelerated their completion uh, of, um, if you like, phase one of the neighborhood policy. Uh, phase one of the neighborhood policy being the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements uh, and then alongside uh, the visa liberalization completed in the case of, uh, of Moldova, on track in the case of Georgia and Ukraine. Now, the question is what come next? And what comes next is actually an accession process. Yeah, there's only so much we can uh, sort of try to, to, to reinvent uh, the wheel. Now, this, if you like, on the one hand. On the other hand, you basically have the crisis in Ukraine, which has exposed uh, in an extremely vivid manner, of course, something that we always knew, which was the fragility uh, of these states, including front runners like uh, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia. These are ultimately states that don't control all their territories. Uh, the fragility of their gov the weaknesses of their governance systems uh, broadly across, if you like, energy, uh, political, uh, economic, etc., cetera, uh, sort of domains has allowed precisely the kind of infiltration that we have seen by Russia. This isn't, you know, this this isn't, if you like, a classic case of warfare. Obviously, there is the hard military element, uh, but it's uh, by no coincidence called uh, a hybrid uh, war, precisely because it, uh, uh, if you like, tries to, um, uh, if you like, open the cracks in the doors uh, presented precisely the, by the fragility of these states. So you ultimately have a situation in which um, 
if you like, the next step would be the beginning of an accession process, but actually we're talking about states that are not really uh, functioning states. Um, and in order to get there, uh, one would need to have a, an agenda, which is not actually an integration agenda, if it, it, it's a state building agenda. Uh, so it seems to me that over the next, I would say five years at least, uh, rather than thinking of what's the next step in the integration process, which is actually an accession process, uh, one should actually be thinking about a more classic foreign policy agenda, uh, which is actually largely centered, not exclusively, but also largely centered on hard security. I mean, making these states functioning states able to, you know, basically getting in the position to be able to submit a credible uh, uh, accession application a few years down the line. Costas, do you want to give it another try? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh, well. good, good. I apologize for the technical difficulties um, a little bit earlier, but we figured it out. So the question is, um, sorry, Ron, I think I, I missed part of your question it was about the enlargement, right? And whether, is that is that correct? Yes, whether it's time now to reconsider a neighborhood policy to include membership. Yeah, um, well, um, it sounds like enlargement has become for the European Union the foreign policy tool of last resort. Uh, and it sounds to me sometimes um, that if nothing else works, then, then let's just think about enlargement. And it goes back to, I think, the earlier question, which I was not able to answer, as to what is the EU what, as a foreign policy act, or do we really need it? Is it necessary? Well, the European Union is there, so I don't think it's something that will go away. Um, and the question is, what kind of a foreign policy will it have? Um, and so if it wants to have a more classic um, type of foreign policy, then it needs perhaps to start considering instruments other than enlargement in order to try to affect change in third countries. So I'm not saying that enlargement is not valuable. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen or if it should happen. But um, I'm, I'm, I find it interesting that enlargement is one of the foreign policy instruments that keep, keep coming up when EU foreign policy is um, debated like here today as opposed to, let's say, when the United States foreign policy or some other country's foreign policy is being debated. Um, I, I understand there is a lot of benefits to it. It has worked a lot in the past. Um, I'm not sure if it can work again in the future in the way it worked, let's say, in the case of the Mediterranean enlargements or the Eastern European enlargements in 2004 and later. Um, um, but, of course, it, it is a very effective tool, and we know that it, it has worked. So I, I understand why it comes keeps coming back in, in debates about external relations. Ulrich, you had your hand up. Yes. Yes. Um, do you hear me? Okay. Um, yes. I, I agree with Costas that enlargement is not a tool for everything. If we look at South Caucasus, Central Asia, North Africa, uh, even the relationship with Turkey, we don't know where this will go. Um, there needs to be other um, procedural um, instruments because the EU needs some kind of procedural instruments. It cannot just have a foreign policy as a state because there's no foreign ministry. There's a high representative, but this is not a foreign ministry. There is no clear executive. So it needs to have some procedures, and this is the this is the advantage of these programs, that, that like neighborhood policies, everybody has agreed and has given a mandate to Brussels. I think so. This is the kind of tools the EU can work with, and it's true that in its relations with the neighborhood, uh, the the main tool has been enlargement, and it's also true that there needs to be other um, instruments. But in the case of Ukraine. Uh, I think um, the promise of uh, accession should be should be given without any problems, especially because it's not uh, we don't talk about five or ten even ten years, but the the way this would in encourage internal reform in Ukraine, it, it's just I mean this is the major question we get people like I get from Ukraine why why don't you give us this hope it's it's just hope of um, 
that at the end of the tunnel, we can become in 20 years, Ukraine can become something like Poland. And it's, it's re relatively easy to give. And I don't think that the costs would, would be so high, the political costs. But of course, big member states would have to agree on that. Natalie, I'm conscious of the fact that you have to leave us in a short time. And I want to take advantage of both your expertise and, um, shall we say, your position to, to switch, to pivot slightly towards the Middle East, in the, uh, which you have written about uh, extensively. The recent statement by uh, the high representative suggested that the EU needed and would work more closely with Arab states and Turkey on dealing with the uh, threat of militant Islam. Um, I guess my question to you is, what might such a policy look like, um, and how would it fit into existing EU foreign policy initiatives, if it even would? It's clear that um, the, uh, the, you know, the attacks in, in Paris, uh, the, the broad phenomena of, uh, of foreign fighters has like, re-exposed uh, the nexus between internal and external uh, security. Um, now, that to me has, on the one hand, a strong, obviously, transatlantic component uh, beyond the Middle East, uh, which uh, will and, and I think is being uh, strengthened uh, at the moment. But then, obviously, it's clear that this is a phenomenon that can only really be contrasted uh, in partnership with the actors of the region. Uh, now, you raised the, uh, the issue of Turkey. I mean, this is, uh, Turkey has been, obviously, in a way, part of, uh, of the problem and was up until very recently part of the problem, given that, uh, as we all know, most foreign fighters uh, have been traveling uh, through, through Turkey. Uh, I would say that it was part of the problem because it was, uh, in a sense, the Turkish mistake um, was perhaps not so different from the mistake that we all made. Uh, which was really the idea that, uh, given that uh, Assad was going to be toppled uh, after tomorrow, uh, anything that would have accelerated uh, that that event was a good thing. So, uh, if you like, deliberate negligence, I would say, uh, was was the attitude that I think everyone uh, had on this issue. Uh, and of course, the minute in which Turkey. Uh, adopted that, that attitude, it led to the problem that we all know today. Now, the question is, where do we move, move from here? Now, of course, um, if we take the Turkey question, uh, there has been, uh, over the last uh, several we uh, weeks, uh, increased cooperation on this issue uh, between the EU uh, and Turkey uh, on the question of, uh, of foreign fighters. Now, having said that, uh, unfortunately, I really see, um, if you like, the limits uh, of how much this uh, cooperation can actually go. Uh, and I say this uh, because, in a way, Turkey has almost gone too far. And it's almost gone too far um, in its, if you like, negligent uh, support for, for jihadis to the extent that beyond the foreign fighters going to and from Turkey, you basically have a what, depending on different polls, two to four percent tacit support for ISIS and I, an ISIS-like ideology uh, in Turkey. Now, four uh, percent in a population of 76 million is well beyond the three to five thousand foreign fighters that we have in Europe. Um, so Turkey is incredibly exposed to this to this phenomenon, both on the inside and, of course, alongside its 900 kilometer frontier with, with, with Syria, that even if a change of policy actually does occur, and I think to a large extent, not completely, but to a large extent it has occurred, there's obviously an objective difficulty of how much uh, that control uh, can, actually, can actually be. So unfortunately, I think on this, on this issue, uh, you know, we're in a containment phase, um, but um, I'm, I'm, to be honest, slightly pessimistic as to how much we can actually resolve this question at this point in time. Looking at the Middle East, I can't imagine why anybody would be pessimistic. 
part of the problem, i would think, is that the if we have a state-based model and the high representative's statement referred to states, then many of them with whom you would work are barely operating as states libya, syria, iraq at least turkey has a functioning state but if these foreign fighters and their ideology are propagated in those places and directed at europe the eu needs a partner who will that partner be in such an enterprise well i mean exactly i mean the the point that you raise really hits the nail on the head i mean you basically have uh, if you like um it, two well uh, three types of actors here um you have on the one hand a country like turkey which as you say is a functioning state uh, but has if you like objective uh, limits to how much it can do and if you like politically it hasn't 100% come round to actually wanting to do this then you have failed states which even if they did want to uh, don't actually exist anymore uh, and, and and are of course the major source uh, if you like of the, of the phenomenon and then you have states like the gulf states um, where there is i believe a profound ideological problem in the sense that ultimately this is a phenomenon that start i mean that uh, if you like the wahhabi ideology uh, that ISIS espouses is actually exactly the same as the one underpinning the Saudi state. Uh, so how can you really uh, contrast something which is, if you like, uh, your, 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 your stepson of sorts? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a fundamental ideological problem there, which I think, and this is a question that relates not only to the European Union, but perhaps primarily, I would say, to the United States, uh, should really, uh, and I think it is beginning to do so, but we should be doing it much faster and much more deeply, uh, get us to question uh, our fundamental alliances in the region. Of course, this then brings up the whole question of Iran, which paradoxically, uh, in the chaos that we're, we're facing, almost looks like a rational actor. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to report you to Homeland Security for calling Iran a rational actor. Don't try to get a visa anytime soon. Uh, Natalie appropriately raises the United States, and I'm going to turn to you, Michael, because you are sitting in Washington, and uh, I want to get your take on where you think U.S., EU, or U.S.-European relations stand now, uh, especially in, with the background of these terror attacks, but also the ongoing negotiations on trade. I'm not your Michael. There you go. Quick follow up to what Natalie said. There you go. Okay. Okay. I think she's quite right to mention the Gulf countries as a, ma a major challenge both for the United States and for Europe. Um, both the United States and countries like uh, France and other EU member states have privileged and very close relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirates, Qatar, and other states in the region. Now, these states as states have no interest in destabilizing France or other European countries. However, citizens of these countries are very much uh, behind the provision of funds to these extremist groups. And I think the US and the European countries really need to concert and to use the leverage they have through the privileged relations with these countries to get them to understand that they need to come down on their citizens who are financing these groups. I think in the end, these regimes themselves are more fragile than people believe. And we ought to get them to understand that if this continues, they themselves might find themselves in the hotspot um, in the future. So I do think that here is a subject for EU-US uh, cooperation, particularly in the light of uh, President Obama's famous 2009 uh, Cairo speech and of uh, the very close relations that both sides still have with these countries, which indirectly are involved in fermenting terrorism through financial support by their citizens to these groups. Now, beyond that, where is the EU-US relationship going? 
I think we should see the negotiations for the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, known as TTIP, um, in the jargon, also in a political light, um, against the background of all the challenges that we've been talking about, and also um, the economic and political challenges in Asia, um, there is a new understanding on both sides of the Atlantic, or rather a recall of the fact that we do fundamentally um, share the same values, and also that as trade and investment partners, we form uh, the most important economic bloc um, in the world. And TTIP is a response to that. The difficulty, of course, lies in the special interests on both sides of the Atlantic that feel threatened by the liberalization that such an agreement would bring. I think in reality, the negotiations would bring solutions to many, if not all, of these problems. The famous question about standards, for example, we all know that cars in the United States are basically safe to drive, cars in the European Union are safe to drive, and yet both sides spend something like $2,000 per vehicle on retesting a car from the other side before allowing it, allowing it to, uh, to, to be driven on, on, on the roads of the other parties. And there are countless examples of the losses from this kind of uh, duplication and the potential economic gains. For the European Union, TTIP is the only major project on the horizon that could provide a stimulus to growth and jobs in the medium term beyond crisis management in the Eurozone. So I think the interests are there, whether political or economic, on both sides. The question is, does the political will exist? Sitting here in Washington, it seems that the climate is now more favorable after the uh, midterm elections than previously. It is imaginable now that um, Congress might give trade promotion authority to the president both for the Trans-Pacific Partnership and for TTIP. This still remains to be seen. Um, if it does so, the, the difficulties in specific areas will remain. We know all the doubts and hesitations in Europe, where it's also seen in a political context, particularly in Germany, as the major trading power in the European Union, but where the affair of the DNA, uh, the bugging of the telephone of the Chancellor, and all the other issues related to that have led to um, a new wave of anti-Americanism. So beyond concerns with chlorinated chickens and all the rest of it, does the political will exist on both sides to make a success of these negotiations? One thing is clear, and that is that we need a breakthrough in the next year before we approach the last year of the Obama administration. And if this does not occur, then the whole question will be put on the back burner um, for the next two or three years until a new president is in place. We then find ourselves confronted with elections in Germany, France, and other member states. So a really big push is needed in the next 12 months if this is to become a reality. In other words, not having done it on one tank of gas, they'll need to refill <laughs> for another tank of gas. Natalie, are you saying goodbye? Okay. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Babysitter's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Babysitter's Trump the EU. Thank you for participating, Natalie. Thank you. Bye bye. Ulrich, you had your you had your hand up. Yes. Um, on uh, TTIP and Germany, um, Germany is split. I think the last uh, poll was forty something like forty percent in favor, forty percent against and uh, the rest uh, neutral. Um, Angela Merkel is very much behind that. And she has spoken out publicly several times in favor of TTIP. It's really very high on her agenda because of her general view that the, the West needs to uh, become stronger economically in order to, to tackle all these challenges. So yes, but there is the problem of trust in, in, in German-US relations um, after all this NSA spying and so on. I think it's still a big issue in Germany, in German public opinion, and uh, it has uh, cost uh, the US deeply, especially also not to, not to really um, 
respond to the German concerns. Uh, there wasn't much uh, response or understanding for, in Washington for, for uh, German complaints. But um, on the other side, we may see, you know, get this more in the background, especially with the Islamist uh, attacks, the jihadist attacks. People think more about uh, information sharing. Uh, the wave swings a little bit back towards um, more cooperation because of fear of terrorism. So, so we might enter there into a new phase also of international cooperation, which may be favorable uh, to TTIP. Merkel is very much behind this, as I said, but we don't know to what extent she will really, you know, go, go on the marketplace and speak out in favor. Uh, that is a, is a big question. And uh, in, in my view, we will get some TTIP because otherwise both sides uh, would lose face. But the, the, the challenge is to make it as comprehensive as possible, to integrate as much as possible so that the, the benign um, uh, consequences uh, can really um, come from that. And otherwise, it's in, in, in I think what, what nobody really, you know, people are arguing in favor of TTIP because uh, for economic reasons. But there is not much strategic um, arguing in favor of TTIP as something that can really bind the West together, the US and the EU, a, a kind of renaissance uh, in relations, something that is, fits more into the 21st century. We, we have NATO as a uh, military alliance, but there's not much on the political side. We have some EU-US summits, which are problematic uh, for other reasons because they only focus on Brussels and member states are not uh, part of that. I think that's a problem. But with TTIP, we would really on the economic side have a you know, kind of um, constant uh, new, um, um, also perhaps institutionalized relationship, which would really make uh, bind the West closer together and, and create some kind of uh, transatlantic renaissance. Well, if you are wondering about TTIP, fortunately, I can tell you that our third conversation this spring, this is a, a bald advertisement, is on TTIP called T-Tipping Point, um, the present and future of transatlantic relations in March 17th uh, at the same time. Uh, I, I want to turn to the students at Miami FIU who I know have been watching attentively, and ask them or Professor Friedman if uh, they have a question for our panelists. You have to be sure and unmute yourself when you do that. I have a question in regards to TTIP. Um, how do you think that will uh, affect the European Union and uh, the relationship they have uh, also with the US and the new Eurasian Economic Union that um, has been put in place by Russia? How, how do you think that's going to counter um, Russia's ambitions as well? Could you repeat your question a little more loudly, please? <laughs> OK. Um, in regards to TTIP, and um, what it's going to be doing for Europe and uh, the U.S. as well, that, that relationship. How do you think that's going to um, uh, go in regards to Russia's new establishment of the Eurasian Economic Union and uh, the countries that are part of that? How do you think that will bode with uh, the relationship we have with Russia as well and Europe? All right. Did everyone hear that? The link between TTIP and uh, relations with Eurasian states, especially especially Russia. No takers, Stefan. Well, I, I would say at best this would be a very indirect relationship. I think the, uh, TTIP, uh, if to work, it will require a huge amount of leadership by the political leaders because the atmosphere in the EU at the moment is quite toxic. What comes together is sort of um, anti-globalization feelings, latent anti-Americanism, mistrust of the political elite, uh, and altogether 
it can will probably only happen if there is really tremendous leadership by by the top uh, politicians of Europe. Uh, I think regarding the Eurasian uh, Union, uh, the EU is, uh, I think, contemplating uh, strengthening a dialogue with this institution as as part of the efforts to uh, diffuse the Ukraine crisis. Uh, I think we would be very, very much at the very, very beginning of this because uh, I think the Eurasian Union is not really functional as as the customs union yet. There are huge issues there, and I, I think uh, any kind of dialogue we would have with it would be uh, a confidence building measure. It would not be operational in terms of uh, preparing a free trade arrangement immediately. Maybe. That is far down the line. So I, I don't. I see only a very, very indirect relationship with the TTIP. I'd like to switch the focus a little bit to the somewhat broader, uh, a somewhat broader angle. I mentioned early on that the EU is a unique, and all of you know this, of course, a unique foreign policy actor that needs the assent of its member states, and they guard their prerogatives uh, jealously. But in one respect, they are like other foreign policy actors, including the United States or Great Britain or France, which is in what I call blurry. That is, what happens domestically in the area of domestic policy, nevertheless, like it or not, becomes a foreign policy action. This is evident in Europe in the recent events where we have consistently seen commentary that one of the things Europe has not done well, uh, sometimes Europe, sometimes particular countries are pointed to, is integrating its Muslim minorities. And that by failing to do so, it is essentially blunting its capacity as a foreign policy actor and making itself vulnerable to criticism, lack of cooperation, and in the extreme, even terrorist attacks. Uh, I guess my question is, is this a false link? Um, do, is there a domestic spillover into foreign policy or is it run the other way? That is that in the interest of an EU foreign policy, European member states and the organization as a whole must do a better job on this question. Michael. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ron, I think you have put your finger on an extremely important issue, particularly following the Paris attacks. But I don't think we should see this first and foremost in the context of foreign policy. First and foremost, it's a major challenge for our societies. After the murderous attacks in Paris, um, a strong response is needed, and it's needed at different levels. We already touched on the question of a foreign policy matter, that is, relations with the states whose citizens are providing support, financial, logistic support to these groups. But there are two other levels of response that are absolutely necessary. One is in the area of security, and we've seen in France that President Hollande is now reviewing uh, previous decisions to cut the budget for the military and for the police. We know that France is in a very tight squeeze economically as a result of the economic and financial crisis, but um, the Commission, the European Commission, has made a little bit more fiscal space for France recently by relaxing some of the financial conditions imposed on it. And if the European Central Bank were to launch um, quantitative easing, perhaps the budget pressures would not be so tight. So it's important to do something more at the level of security to reassure citizens that they can live peacefully in their own countries uh, without the risks of violent attacks um, upon them and uh, their fellow citizens. A sensitivity particularly strong in the Jewish community, but also in the Muslim community itself, um, in France um, and in other countries. We've also seen that there's now the prospect for progress in areas like um, passenger uh, names, 
uh, data which have been blocked by the European Parliament until now, but where France is ready to take uh, unilateral steps and where Merkel has spoken about um, the fact that the EU must also follow up at its level. Other security steps are clearly needed, but security alone is not the answer. Europe doesn't need and doesn't want um, a Patriot uh, Act. Um, the third area where something really has to happen is the area that you mentioned, which is the integration of the large unintegrated Muslim populations, particularly in France. First of all, one must make the point that the majority of Muslims in France, where they are about 7.5% of the population, or in Germany or in other member states, are well integrated. France has a tremendous tradition of integrating immigrants throughout the 20th and early 21st century. But in the banlieue, the depressed urban areas around the big cities, there is a very large population that is not integrated, either because of rejection by mainstream society or because of obstacles in that community itself to integration. And after these terrible attacks, we've already seen um, that issues that should have been tackled years and years ago are coming to the fore once again, like, for example, the need to separate delinquents, common crime delinquents in prisons from those who are either suspected of terrorist action or who are uh, likely to be uh, radicalizing uh, elements. By the way, such issues were identified um, under President Mitterrand 30 years ago. And the tragedy is that we have known now for a generation uh, that action was needed to help to integrate these minorities. There have been countless uh, commissions of uh, inquiry and recommendations, which until now have not been acted upon. The, the, the important thing is that after these huge demonstrations of unity in France and elsewhere in Europe, that we should not now just let the dust settle and see the issue fade away. The important thing is that there really needs to be progress in all these areas, these three areas that I've mentioned, including the better integration of uh, minorities. If not, we will simply sit back and wait for the next terrorist attack. We saw this uh, police uh, disarming a potential attack uh, in Belgium with some loss of life. So the main challenge is to keep this at the top of the agenda and not, as so often in the past, to let it fade away once the immediate shock of the attack diminishes. Um, I fully agree with what Michael said, but I think there's also a second element. This is also a reminder that Europe cannot afford to have such a zone of um, pre-modern um, situation um, or non-state um, um, or a region where basically the uh, there's no state, there is no security, and so on, so on. You have this in Yemen. We have this now very much in Syria. This has become a training camp for terrorists. It also provides a narrative. It encourages young people in Europe to go there. They return. And I think this is, this is um, something that um, will just grow. I remember the discussions that we had about Afghanistan. And one main point, you know, to convince European publics to go to Afghanistan to fight uh, at the Hindu Kush was that we cannot allow to have training camps for terrorism in that region. But now we have it right besides our borders. And uh, I think Syria is, is the cancer. And we see just you know, years of European inaction in Syria. We saw Everybody has its proxies, but liberal democracy has no proxies in Syria. Europeans have nobody to fight for liberal values, for European values there. The Americans support, I mean, a little bit, but there is ba basically it's, it's dictatorship versus anarchy or versus, versus jihadism. And we let this happen over the years. And we, we Europeans were just putting their head down and saying this is something well, we can't do anything, you know, this, this is, and now the situation is moving towards uh, supporting Assad, um, who has, by uh, 
the, who is, in my view, I mean, I, I just cannot see how we can bring uh, a Syrian state back under the rule of Assad after all these killings. So I think this is just a sign of giving up on Syria. But um, overall, this 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 um, jihadism returning to Europe also means to us that we need to go in that region and play a role in that region. And we don't have we don't do that. We don't have a, the U.S. is is disengaging to a certain extent, or just choosing its um, priorities much more than in the past. And this leaves just uh, blank areas where nobody really engages, Libya, Syria, uh, Yemen to a certain extent. Um, this will, I mean, either we accept that we have less security inside Europe, or we, we try to have a common joint transatlantic strategy to, to change things on the ground in that region. Costas. Um, thank you. Yeah, so your original question was if immigration, Ron, if immigration policy is foreign policy, if, or if foreign policy is immigration policy, am I correct? And I think the answer well, actually, that is, I, go ahead. I had it, it was somewhat more broadly phrased, it, immigration policy is part of it, but it has to do with the integration of societies, what, what the EU does domestically. And right. foreign policy impact. Immigration is part of that. It's, it's part of that. But but I think what we I think there is a pattern that emerges from our discussion here. At least it emerges, I can see it, I don't know if everybody else can, that you can say foreign policy is separate from all these other policy areas, whether it's the economy, whether it's it's integration. I think the big question in the European Union is who gets to implement those different policies or make decisions? Will it be the European Union institutions in Brussels? Where will it be, you know, the member states? Who in the member states? And I think that's where in the European Union it gets always a little bit tricky um, because, you know, we're talking about a foreign policy. There is, um, you know, this memo um, to the uh, high representative, uh, but then you know, that's definitely foreign policy. But then there are all these other issues that affect foreign policy that are not managed and by the high representative or by anybody in Brussels. They're managed by, by member states, uh, but they still reflect on the European Union. And I think the big challenge is who gets to coordinate all these different actors and, and create some sort of coherence in this area. And it seems like what the EU, when it tries to put out one fire, um, you know, another one sort of lights up somewhere else, and it's, it's somewhere else, someone, somebody else needs to take care of this new fire now. And so, it, to me, that's sort of the big challenge in, in the EU. It's, it's trying to get all these actors to, to act in a, in a way that's somewhat coherent. And, and, I, and I think the reason why I enjoyed the, the memo is because it has very concrete proposals that outline how this can happen. Stefan. Thank you. Just uh, three quick points on this jihadist threat in Europe. Uh, I think the first issue is the impact on the domestic political scene in the member states. I think it will probably give rise to the rightist populist party. It will uh, probably damage the mainstream parties. Uh, it will uh, certainly lead to a sort of polarization in the member states. And related to this first point is the question, will this lead to more Europe? basically stronger European structures, uh, joint uh, common immigration policy, much stronger cooperation between the authorities in internal affairs and justice, or on the contrary, will it lead the member states to reassert their sovereignty in these areas? There were many ministers of the interior in the last few days who mentioned that Schengen maybe was a step too far, maybe uh, terrorists shouldn't be able to move without border controls from, from one country to the other. So there is a real risk that instead of building stronger European structures to deal with these issues, you will actually uh, go back to uh, doing things on the national level, which I think would be the wrong, uh, wrong way out. But, but together with kind of a populist uh, development, uh, this is not unlikely to happen, particularly in France. Uh, there is the third issue is the impact on foreign policy. 
And here the threat is that we go back to a homeland security logic regarding particularly the southern in neighborhood, that we really look at it purely from the point of view of stability and defending ourselves against this threat. We've been there once before, after 9-11, basically the EU, uh, through all its sort of reform, uh, uh, reform dimension of our policy towards this region, out of the window and basically focused exclusively almost on cooperation with the authoritarian regimes in order to keep things under control. And now there is real risk that we revert to this logic and basically again give up on our uh, longer term uh, support for, for credible reforms and, and democratic solutions. I'm conscious of everyone's time, but I don't want to leave without putting each of you on the spot, especially Michael, uh, who is a seasoned diplomat and probably can handle it very easily. But in an interview with Foreign Affairs this past summer, you called this the moment of truth for Europe's foreign policy. And you said that, that, that the EU members will, will either appoint a foreign policy chief who is convincing and experienced or not, shall I shall say, uh, uh, a, a powerful person, or you said, the concern now is that they may not even want a representative, but rather a coordinator. I guess my question to you, and it's unfair in many respects, since we're only in the very early days of the new high representative's term, is how do you make it so far uh, and what do you think it means for EU foreign policy institutions? A question that cost us raised quite frankly. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, you yes. can. Thank you. The first thing I would say is that Stefan is at least as seasoned a diplomat as I am, if not a considerably more seasoned one. Therefore, I think that his view counts for at least as much, if not more, than uh, my own. Um, but let me be very direct in my response to your question. I think that uh, the member states have shown that they intend to handle the most challenging high policy questions themselves. And they do not expect the European Union or the high representative to play the major role in this respect. And they are looking for um, the high representative, who was also vice president of the commission, um, to coordinate, to take initiatives to a certain degree, probably to work much more closely with other members of the European Commission than her predecessor has done. And I think this is an area where she can be strong and uh, effective, trying to mobilize the instruments that are controlled by the commission in favor of certain foreign policy tasks. She's chairing the group of uh, external commissioners inside the commission, which her predecessor did not do. Um, she's certainly a person with uh, a knowledge and a background of foreign policy, brief experience as uh, a minister, but she is not a heavyweight on the global foreign policy scene. And uh, if we look at some of the initiatives taken or the comments made, even in the last 24 hours, whether with respect to uh, Russia or with respect to the Arab countries, I think we can see that uh, there is scope for considerable uh, progress in uh, taking positions that are uh, reflected and with which uh, the member states can um, identify. So on balance, I think that what I wrote in that article um, has turned out to be the case. Um, the member states are looking essentially for a coordinator. They are happy to delegate certain uh, role to the high representative, um, but uh, uh, on issues uh, concerning, for example, uh, relations with Russia or even with Egypt, um, they prefer to handle this themselves. Well and good, I would say, provided there is more consistency in the future than there has been in the past, between the line they take bilaterally and the positions they expect to emerge from the institutions. Because the main weakness over the last decade or so is that the member states have more or less delegated to the EU institutions um, the promotion of democracy, the strengthening of the rule of law, 
especially human rights issues, while they have felt free to get on with business as usual. In other words, security, trade issues, contracts, investment, access to energy, all these matters have determined their own position. So if they want to give a chance to the new high representative and um, a chance even to the more limited ambition of coordination, we have to see them accepting on the one side that the EU will be more realistic and perhaps somewhat less idealistic in um, its policy initiatives. And secondly, that the member states themselves do not cut across the initiatives that they have delegated to the institutions by playing purely um, the realpolitik game as they have tended to do in the past. Well, uh, um, as, as a matter of fact, uh, that provides an excellent bookend. Uh, the Carnegie report with which we began uh, includes in discussion of foreign policy the following sentence. In these cases, the Union must protect narrower European security and economic interests while continuing to criticize human rights abuses, engage civil society, and stand ready for democratic reform. It certainly sounds like realism triumphant, but whether or not it will be able to be put into place, of course, remains to be seen. When that happens, I will gather up my expert panel again and ask them their comments. But what remains for me to do today is to thank them, Michael, Stefan, Ulrich, Kostas, and Natalie in absentia for joining us and allowing us to question them on these topics. I want to thank my colleagues at um, Miami and FIU uh, for joining us. I want to remind all of you that you should be able to review this on our website within a short amount of time and hope you enjoyed yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.